once the lecture is over i will share complete uh, this uh, lecture audio video by end of the evening right but uh, just keep your mic mute silent mode try to understand the questions try to answer the questions and try to understand the logic of the questions don't be in a hurry i will give you 10 seconds 15 seconds 30 seconds in between after the exam right it's absolutely a learning platform and that is why we are doing exercise on the holidays just to make you better that what's the feel of the exam right so let's go and start with the first questions so this is the first questions in front of your screen you see a 35 year old man who is complaining of rashes and itching which is on and off for the months on the examination you find symmetrical well defined red a plaque which a uh, silvery scale on the extensor aspect of the elbow and knee. Also, you find a pitting and thickening of the nails. What is the diagnosis and treatment of this patient? Options are for A, lichen planus, topical corticosteroid, chronic plaque psoriasis, topical corticosteroid plus topical vitamin D preparation, C, gute psoriasis, topical corticosteroid plus vitamin D, and erythrodermic psoriasis methotrexate. Those who are new, first time in my class, you think over this question's answer. I have already given you. So you start your brain now and try to understand and give the answer. Right? If you want to be a master of any MCQ, you need to understand this triad. And this triad contains three things. Let me draw the big triad here. Right? One, you must know what is the diagnosis in this MCQ. How you investigate in this MCQ. This is second part. This is first part. And third part is the treatment. So if you cultivate the practice of doing these three things, I think you are a master of any MCQ, believe me. So now onwards, what you need to do, any MCQ comes in front of you, you need to do ask three things to yourself. What's the diagnosis of this MCQ? What's the investigation or how I investigate this patient? And what's the treatment? Yeah, so now you post your answer. What do you think? I mean, why... Right. This is everything is clear cut in front of your screen. Right. So these all questions are asked in the previous exam. So don't take it lightly. This is little weird questions, but it will be helpful. Yes, Dr. Dr. Javed, any, any explanation? This is interactive platform. So if you wish, you can interact. You can now unmute. Dr. Javed. One second. Hello, sir. Yes, yes, sir. Welcome, sir. Welcome. Actually, I'm a little bit weak in dermatology. Like, I, like I have read, read somewhere, like, like uh, this pity, uh, like uh, nails. Uh, so I just, I don't know. Actually, this I just put uh, be option. No problem. No, no. Yeah. But I'm happy. At least you posted the answer because in exam, I advise you personally. Don't make it anything blank. Whatever you don't know, take A, B, C, D, whatever, randomly, right? Because sometimes yeah. it you may be correct. So so making a logic, there is no logic of making it empty, right? Take whatever yes, your heart says. Anyway, right. So yes, Monica, any any explanation, Dr. Monica? Let's see. I mean, we are it's a interactive, so we spend at least five minutes on questions. So there are a lot of things will be cleared. Yes, doctor. Dr. Preeti, any comment? Yes, sir. Uh, it shows like uh, uh, silver, silver scaly blocks in the extensor. It can be a psoriasis. First diagnosis will be. Okay, and so, pitting. So let me share with everyone just to make it more concept clear. Psoriasis. So what's Dr. Preeti is trying to tell? Psoriasis. What is the clue of the psoriasis? Is? Silver what, scale. What, right. So silver scale. Silver scale. Right, Itching so can this be is present or not present in psoriasis. Some patients have, some patients don't have it. It's not one, ideal. Wonderful, wonderful. So, silver scale is basically whenever you see in exam that silver scaly skin, right, or silver scaly word, just try to think of psoriasis. Okay, fine. So, you make job little easy diagnosis, right? Now yes. they are asking for the treatment. So, how do you treat this silver scaly? Skin? Uh, Normally, we treat with the uh, immunosuppressant like methotrexate and uh, folic acid. But here, they are given as a white topical only. And only the erythrodermic psoriasis, they have given methotrexate. But uh, the patient is having for on and off for months. It can be a chronic case. So it should be a chronic plague psoriasis. Wonderful. And uh, gutted psoriasis will be in uh, dots. And they did not mention any papules or something. 
so it could be a chronic plaque psoriasis it can be treated with corticosteroids sir and vitamin d can be yes but because all skin diseases we can treat with the vitamin d deficiency you looks like a dermatologist mm -hmm. thank you very much thank great you, wonderful so now the job is easy right this is off and on for months months means something chronic dr javed you got it little bit clear right so 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 this yes, is sir. for right. months so it's a chronic silver scale yes. plaque blah blah it's like a psoriasis right so you now homework of everyone everyone not just the those who have wrong answer again yes. one thing i am whatever the question i am discussing today 15 it's equivalent to 80 questions 100 questions today in one question we make 10 question right so yes. you need to check your score you don't need to tell me or you don't need to send me but you assess yourself before going for the exam that is it the good score ask yourself if not prepare well prepare hard prepare smart right so this is a psoriasis is the diagnosis how do you diagnose dr preeti it's a visual diagnosis or you do some biopsy actually it's a to clinical understand? just to finish this trial right actually it is a clinical diagnosis sir. Uh, otherwise you can even uh, can if you have a severe doubt sometimes psoriasis can look like tinea also if can be scraping can be done and can be get diagnosed with that. wonderful so basically whenever you are in doubt or there are a lot of differential diagnosis you do the scaling you do some super special biopsy as well and you do the histopath Usually not required because ninety percent of the skin problems are visual, right? Tinea versicolor, tinea pedis, tinea corporis, fungal onycholysis, mm -hmm. right? Eczema, diaper rash, right? Herpes zoster. There are thousands of things, right? So you just see it and you tell it. That's it, right? So no much fancy investigations like cardiology or hematology is required here, right? So psoriasis is the visual impression, the diagnosis clear cut, right? Chronic things because it's for months and months. Right and treatment, as she rightly told, that chronic. This is only the options: topical steroid plus vitamin D. So this is the options of the answer. So answer is B. This is the picture. I try to always uh, this uh, mention. So so if you see the first picture, this is the first picture, right? This is the first picture. So in first picture, you can see very clear cut that oh fine how it looks like, right? So this is the chronic psoriasis, right? So this is the first picture. Extensor, you see the the scaly, right? This is a rash, right? This is a plague psoriasis, extensor surface. It is produced from the expert handbook of clinical medicine. Since this is gutte psoriasis, as she told, this is onycholysis, usually seen in the nails. So these all are the specific question. If you, they have given you this picture and tell, to tell you what is the diagnosis, what diagnosis, onycholysis, that's it. So, so you need to little see the pictures as well, especially in the skin department, right? So this is the things. So what's the answer? Topical steroid once a day, right? You can apply topical uh, vitamin D preparation is also you can apply, right? Review at the four weeks how the clinical response is there, right? And uh, potent corticosteroid should not be used for more than eight weeks. Just you need to know it should be treated uh, with a break of at least four weeks. And uh, TAR is also a treatment of choice. So these are the few treatment options for chronic psoriasis. So why I, I pose these questions because many times we try to avoid psoriasis. This is what I seen in students, right? Many students, they don't do the psoriasis. They don't do the skin condition. They don't do the anything, right? And and the same thing will come in exam and you are getting disappointed. Oh, sir, a lot of questions from the skin come. So don't ignore anything, right? Try to do the balance preparation for all the subjects. So psoriasis is a homework for everyone. Those who did not read the psoriasis, go and read the psoriasis. It will definitely come in the exam, right? So don't try to uh, consider that oh, psoriasis will not come. But your exam comes with psoriasis two questions. So go and read the basic. I don't want you to do the PhD in psoriasis. Just try to understand the basics of psoriasis. Get ready with the pen and paper and think of these questions once again, right? The second question is in front of your screen. A 32-year-old woman who has... Oh, who gave birth four months ago is brought in her by uh, brought in by her husband because of depressed mood. The husband reports that she has been depressed since the birth of the her child, and that happens four months ago. Refused to eat, has trouble sleeping, and is unable to concentrate. The woman reports that she has lost interest in everything and sometimes cannot even get out of the bed. She has recently had visions of seeing her deceased mother talking to her 
and criticizing her skill as a new mother she also admits that she hears her voice taking uh, talking to her constantly she denies homicidal or suicidal ideation which of the following is the best initial treatment are you going to give a psychotherapy behavioral therapy sertraline resperidon or phenylzine again my trial will come right so trial will no not go away in any questions so they are directly jumping on the treatment but before the jumping on the treatment you need to know what is the diagnosis if at all any investigation required what it could be and then treatment will comes so i am absolutely sure if you don't have the diagnosis of this question 99% your answer will be wrong still you try i am giving you all the hits how to interpret the questions before going to the exam right so you need to understand take your time take 10 15 seconds think over it and then we'll discuss i'll give chance to another doctor preeti so they <laughs> can yes dr mohammad abid would you like to sir make any comment i got only five answers amongst long list or long lots of doctors in the guru but i got only five six answers dr n a n n dr n yes sir any comment hmm. sir i feel the diagnosis is uh, postpartum uh, uh, depression okay let me go step by step postpartum depression okay so this is the only thing so you feel that something along with the depression is there let me let me you will going to give the answer it's a excellent important mcqs and lot of doubts will be cleared what what the term you called this as she is seeing or vision of screening her deceased mother who died but she is seeing right and she is criticizing to the patient that you are not a good mother right so vision vis vision of seeing or seeing something also she is hearing something hallucination Halluc hallucination so this is also hallucination so i think what i understood is two hallucination visual hallucination auditory am i right or wrong doctor yes sir. yes right so when there is a depression plus hallucination so depression what do you understand by depression what do you understand by psychosis anyone knows anyone have any idea right so so this is i think it's not just the depression because in depression if you go and read the diagnostic criteria of depression can anyone tell me what is the diagnostic criteria of depression major criteria quickly any volunteer fast anyone uh it should be more than 6 months or what 6 month but what term is what 6 month of what uh, more than 6 month of what no mood. sorry sadness anxiety. no mood <clears throat> anxiety sadness no mood that's it these are the criteria sadness no mood can be in depression sadness and no mood is in hypothyroidism sadness and no mood with some many many anti psychiatric and anti psychotic drug as well sadness and no mood right it could be because of chronic anxiety loss of uh, uh, disturbed sleep yeah so 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 i am still not happy with the clear cut answer uh, of anyone so go and read again this is second homework this is what very high in so this all will come in exam 100% you will remember me in exam hall that, that sir was telling right huh? i missed it and this trouble so i don't want anyone to be in trouble so go and read the diagnostic criteria of depression diagnostic criteria of depression there is no blood test for depression so it's a diagnostic the criteria patient uh, depressed mood and uh, insomnia weight loss and fatigue and, weight uh, loss or what i know is weight gain as well that is weight loss and uh, weight yes, gain yes weight loss or weight gain right and that is what i remember more than 2 weeks the patient can be in depressed symptoms and uh, no uh, they can be a uh, 
it can be you know so two to four weeks two to four so, symptoms so, of depression so, so somebody told it is a six month you are telling me two weeks so what's more the correct major depressive symptoms will have more than or equal to two weeks normally minor also same thing fair enough so you go and better cross check with it the what is the official guideline it is given in all the books it's a simple questions right so i'm just trying to make you think more i'm just trying i don't want to do a monotonous mcqs right that for that we are not here we are trying to interpret analyze the things and if you once develop the analytic skill na any questions you can answer believe me any questions you can answer right so it's not tough but you need to do some analytic skill for why this why this not why this why this not so by me it's a and have you anybody has read that there is a there is a hallucination is a symptoms in major dip, and depressive disorder so hallucination no, comes in with disorder schizophrenia is of psychotic disorder basically right there are two mainly psychiatric problem either neurosis or psychosis isn't it neurosis and yes, psychosis sir. so you go again how how you differentiate some has a neuro neurosis right neurosis like obsessive compulsive disorder right it's a neurosis is not psychotic disorder schizophrenia sky psychotic right so it could be a depression it could be a schizophrenia so combination of these two right young female right 20 32 years is quite young female right so 32 years female present right with this depressed mood right so depression is there right depressed right so almost 4 months right 4 months ago there is a delivery of the baby and what they are saying uh, depressed since the birth of her child so birth of child is 4 months right and she is refused to eat right so this is again a depression trouble sleeping again a depression again for you guys to know excessive sleeping or less sleeping let me tell you excessive diet or no diet over eating or under eating both are depression so some patients are eating over some patients are eating less some patients are sleeping less some patients are sleeping too much so this both symptoms are extreme so here no eating refuses no sleep or trouble sleeping unable to concentrate that is again a depression right so this all are there along with that she recently ha uh, this is recently that was for four month she has recently had a hallucination of visual hallucination and auditory hallucination right uh, and that is constantly right that is constantly so this all are there with this patient right so now what now what they are saying she denies homicidal so there is a no homicide no this suicidal ideation right which of the following is the best initial therapy so now you tell me what is the best initial therapy for this patient yes anyone open for all anyone sir i think we should go for antipsychotics antipsychotics yes sir antipsychotics okay why not sertraline we don't sertraline will help with depression but uh, what about this hallucination sir okay so you don't want to treat the depression part just you want to treat the hallucination part because she has a depression she has a hallucination she has a psychotic or psychotic symptoms you understand what i'm trying to i'm trying to confuse yes, you i'm trying to sir, confuse but you, you think, definitely uh, but you need to yes, reply but usually for usually mm. usually for uh, postpartum depression psychotherapy is what we opt so maybe we can combine it with psychotherapy for her depression That's and good. go for an antipsychotic like risperidone for her hallucinations fair enough let's see what other experts are saying we have more than 30 expert in this group anyone any comment sir sertraline would be better sertraline would be better so what is sertraline basically <coughs> which group of drug ssri ssri what is the full form of ssri uh, sir uh, let us let us let us discuss now let us let us answer varun we will discuss one by one i am not in hurry yes varun sir, what is ssri full uh, form ssri serotonin uh, secreting uh, receptor inhibitors no no this is not the correct yes anyone ssri full form selective no, serotonin reuptake no. Right. So, so somebody told me, and or yeah. someone answered uh, that serotonin. Select, selective serotonin, selective not secreting, serotonin. not secreting. Selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Right. So this is simple. So we, but we must know, being a doctor, what is a MAO inhibitor? MAO. <laughs> what is the full form of MAO? MAO. 
What monoamine is... oxidase inhibitor. Monoamine. Right. So monoamine <laughs> oxidase inhibitor. So these are the small things, but we never concentrate them. So you should be very sharp in this. Right. Now tell me. So sertraline is a SSRI, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. Right. So sertraline you want to give. And sertraline, how this sertraline will going to help this patient, Varun? Sir, here they have said the best initial treatment. It's initial. So among this, uh, uh, going by the clinical features, and also, sir, she has said that she denies any homicidal and uh, that, that point I, I found that was important. She denies any homicidal or suicidal ideation. So that way okay. I thought certain. Okay, little twist in the question. If she has, uh, she not denies, she, now last line is that, that she has a recurrent, right? Uh, this ideation of homicide and suicide, then what will be the treatment? She is every day four, five Just times treatment. thinking that then I will commit it. suicide. Then Electro ECT. Electro yes, yes. ECT. 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 Right. So ECT. So those who don't know the ECT, just try to understand the ECT. ECT is an electroconvulsive therapy, right? So ECT is an electroconvulsive therapy. Just remember in mind because we are discussing in one question, a lot of questions. So I, I have time limitation, so I'm not going one, one hour for each thing. So those who absolutely don't know ECT, go and read two things only. ECT is an electro convulsive therapy what we see in the movie right somebody pee, right in the opd or emergency room right the right they 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 hold the patient and then apply some electrodes on the cranium right and give the shock to the brain right this is ect in simpler language right electroconvulsive therapy the biggest indication of giving the electroconvulsive therapy is a suicidal ideation suicidal ideation right so you need to make her brain cool and calm otherwise she will jump from the balcony and she will suicide right more common in female than male right so this is very important so go and read the e electroconvulsive though the option is not there but if they say there is a suicidal ideation recurrently to the patient first and foremost treatment is the ect now let's jump to these questions right so 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 you don't want to give a rule psychotherapy to this patient Sir, uh, I felt that uh, serotonin, because they said initially, I felt that was better. Okay, fair enough. Anyone? Anyone? Open? Anyone? Any comment? Last last comment. Resperidone, sir. Antipsychotic. Resperidone. What is resperidone? Antipsychotic, sir. Antipsychotic. Antipsychotic. Where does it act? So, I took, myself, I took one resp resperidone orally. From where it goes, it goes in brain or stomach or blood and how it acts. It's a, a question in exam. Antagonist. It is a dopamine antagonist, sir. What, what number of dopamine antagonist? Dopamine D1, antagonist. D2, D3. D2 receptor. D2 receptor, not D1, yeah. D3. Oh, no, no, I'm just trying to understand. Don't confuse. <laughs> uh, typical will be D2 and uh, atypical will be... Uh, with the 5 ht Fair enough. Fair, fair enough. So other, this is a learning. Na? So other people will also learn. Na? That is why. Because this is again a question. What is the site of action or mechanism of action? Or where does the respiridone will act? This is question in DHA. That is why I am discussing. So respiridone is an antipsychotic drug. Basically as she told. Anti-dopaminic activity. Right? And it acts on the D2 receptor. What are the common side effect of respiridone very frequently exam in every dha demoj every every paper this is a common question weight gain weight gain weight gain weight gain dry mouth fair enough fair enough fair enough no problem so respiridone let's go to the things little patient with the both mood and psychotic symptoms are you agreed both mood as well as psychotic symptoms, mood I told you, right? Depressed mood, not ticking, not sleeping, not eating, difficult concentrating. It's a depression, isn't it? Psychotic symptoms as well. So psychotic, you see visual hallucination, auditory hallucination. Respond to both antidepressant because depression. So you give antidepressant, psychotic symptoms. So you give antipsychotic medication. However, you must treat the worst symptoms first. And in this case, the antipsychotic could be the most indicated to reduce her psychotic symptoms. Is that clear? 
so not eating not much disturbing sleeping is not very bad symptoms so whenever you have the worst symptoms that you need to concentrate first this is a uh, logic in psychotic and in psychiatric disorder so if this patient has a suicide that is one of the worst thing then all the options are gone you have to treat with the anti uh, i mean electroconvulsive therapy but there is no suicidal ideation as it is clear cut mentioned in this in the last line that is why we are not giving electroconvulsive therapy so both so however you must treat the worst symptoms first right this is completely taken from the book standard right so so we need to keep in mind whenever you have the combined scenario whatever the worst symptoms if the worst symptoms is depression you give antidepressant psychotic worse so in this case antipsychotic with the most indicate to reduce the psychotic symptoms another question what is the difference between typical and atypical antipsychotic drug anyone open for all again we hundreds time heard what is typical antipsychotic what is atypical antipsychotic but we never bothered ourselves to go into the detail what is typical and what is atypical and that is why i am little discussing here so typical antipsychotic tends to more strongly blocking dopamine typical is dopamine right more dopaminergic or anti dopaminergic activity in a typical typical means classical atypical has a greater effect on serotonin so this is the biggest difference typical mainly acts on dopamine and atypical mainly acts on the serotonin both group of antipsychotic share the similar side effects so whether you give typical or atypical the side effect profile right toxicity profile is by and large the same as you rightly said what are the side effects so dry mouth as i ask you what is a side effect dry mouth right another is a sleepliness they have sleep weight gain you already told weight gain so these are the few common side effects shared by the typical or atypical the only difference typical acts more on dopamine and that atypical more on serotonin but typical antipsychotic have a greater risk of uncontrollable body movement uncontrollable body movement where the typical respiridon adverse effect extra pyramidal symptoms extra pyramidal symptoms extra pyramidal symptoms now this is again a question what are the extra pyramidal symptoms so if you don't know go and read it i did lit little more exercise to make your concept clear this is a antipsychotic conventional means typical non conventional or atypical so resperidon is a atypical resperidon is a atypical zipracidon right so is atypical eripiprazol is atypical clozapine atypical olanzapine atypical ptipine these are the common which you which you get to know the drug name right so whenever you read this all drugs are the atypical typical and atypical side effect profile is little same typical will act on the dopamine atypical will act on a more on the serotonin level and this is conventional for years and years we know haloperidol so what is haloperidol right it's antipsychotic typical right then uh, we also go plorcropromaz in years and years i'm listening this name this is a typical right and thioridazine this is again a very common what we see in the practice right so chlorpromazine this is again a very common right so these are the typical these are atypical again here the typical as rightly said mainly acts on the d2 receptor atypical antipsychotic d1 as well as d2 as well as d4 and 5h Two receptor. This is very important. Five H two receptor. So broader blockage. D one, D two, D four, and five H T three, right? And psychotic psychosis is a mental health problem that cause people to perceive or interpret the things difficult from those around them, right? And hallucination and illusion. Hallucination and delusions are the two major symptoms. Hallucination and right. So this is just. i mean you need to have a little more clarity we don't need to mug up the answer of the questions if you understood the logic you will better enjoy the subject so these are the two major things right which you come across two main symptoms of psychosis right so one is hallucination so we see there is a visual hallucination as well as auditory hallucination and delusion right so these are the two things 
right? So this you must keep in mind, right? That how it goes. Again, this is excellent chart I come across and I try to uh, give you more in-depth knowledge of side effects profile because the question, there are two questions in psychiatric uh, subjects, mainly two questions. One, sub, one is that, right? What is the effect? I mean, how you select the drug and another is side effect, right? So aripiprazol, olanzipine, right? Quetapine, respiridone, acute Parkinsonism, right? Movement disorder, elevated prolactin and weight gain. So if all, you have already a patient who has 120 kg patient with psychotic symptoms, you, it's not good idea to give the re respiridone. Why not good idea to give the respiridone? Because it's already weight gain na, and you are more trying to increase the weight. So don't give the respiridone. Give the, another drug in the same group. Right, Ziprasidone, we discussed in the last uh, this mock test. Those who attended my last mock test, there was a question which drug prolongs the QT interval, right? So, QT interval is prolonged by the Ziprasidone. So, whenever you are planning to start a Ziprasidone to any patients, you just need to have a baseline EKG or ECG, right? Why? Because if it is a prolonged QT interval, you want you cannot give the ziprasidone to this patient because it will end up with a fatal ventricular arrhythmia or tachycardia may end up with a cardiac arrest and death so these are the very specific questions in your exam so i just try to compile it uh, in a in a in a simpler uh, slide format so i will share it don't worry so you need to know these are the absolutely high yield point right you don't need to do phd on respiridone you just need to know okay what is respiridone where it acts respiridone, what are the common side effects? That's it. Or contraindication, right? So if you know for five, six drugs, respiridone, you need to know sertraline, olanzipine, right? Cetalaropram, acetalopram, right? So these are the few basic drugs which they commonly ask and all questions in our psychiatric department on our website is already there. So you go and check it for better understanding. That's it. Any questions in the 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 house i try uh, my sir, level best uh, to what, make it yes please yes sir. what antipsychotics can be used during a uh, pregnancy and uh, during lactation sir pregnancy and lactation it depends on the drug i mean most of the drug right they are the safe right they they try to continue right because you need to check which drugs are not but let me do more exercise Right, I will write down these questions and try to prepare one list. Right, for you guys, that these are the antipsychotic drug or antidepressant can be given in pregnancy and lactation cannot be given in lactation and pregnancy. Is that okay? This is my homework. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Just to save your time, let me first write down my homework. The drug list for pregnancy and lactation for antidepressant or psychiatric drug. Right. So I will post in the group. Don't worry, earliest. Do some exercise and improve my knowledge. Thank Excellent. you very much, sir. No worries. Great. But it's a good question. You never know. They ask in the pregnant woman, what will you do? So it's a very important, right, for everyone. Third question in front of you. A woman with hepatitis B antigen positive. I selected all diverse questions, not from one department. So you, nobody can blame. Oh, doctor, you asked all 10 questions. Gynec and I'm very poor in gynec. So it's not all gynec, it's a hepatology. Now first is psychiatric, first is another is different question. So let, let's go back and check it, right? So first is the skin questions, right? Chronic plaque psoriasis. This is skin question. This is psychiatric question. This is another third question. So I'm trying to check overall your knowledge. This is how I selected the question. This is hema this is a gastrointestinal or GI related question. Hepatitis. Hepatitis is in liver, right? So a woman with hepatitis B antigen positive gave birth to a baby boy. Now she is worried that she might have passed the hepatitis B infection to the child. What is the most appropriate regimen of immunization for the baby boy? Understand questions well. You have a female or a woman who is HBSAG positive. She had recently given a birth to a baby boy. Now she is worried. Who is married? She is, means mother is worried. Oh, what happens if my baby has a hepatitis B? Now they are asking what immunization you give to the baby. Hepatitis B vaccine, single dose you give now. You give hepatitis B vaccine complete course only. You give hepatitis B vaccine complete course plus immunoglobin. You give only immunoglobin. And no immunization is required because it will go automatically by the natural immunity. That's it. Now your turn. 
take your time 10 15 seconds think over it these are questions from past papers only i'm discussing <laughs> And if you feel your hepatitis B is not good, go ahead and read it. This is absolutely 100% high yield questions. Hepatitis B complete course, sir. You post your answer, no problem. We'll discuss. Just give me 5 10 seconds, sir. At least other doctors also do some brainstorming. Never mug up. Mug up will not absolutely help you. Try to understand. Yeah, sorry, doctor. Who who spoke the last the thing? Sorry, I missed your name. Who has given me the last answer? Yeah, Dr. Preeti, sir. Yeah, so what's your answer, Dr. Preeti? I think a uh, hepatitis B complete course can be given because the three doses course can be given to the child. Okay, so, so, so your answer is B, basically. Yes. Okay. Why don't you want to give the immunoglobulin to the patient? I'm not sure. I'm not, I don't have any about immunoglobulin, sir. Sorry? But uh, I don't have idea about immunoglobulin, sir. Okay, fine. The enough. complete course regarding, I'm telling, already mother would have been taken hepatitis B vaccine. Mm -hmm. And the after the childbirth, at birth, we will give one vaccine and uh, second dose at one month and six months. And mm -hmm. then nine to, after nine to 12 months, we will repeat the serology, whether the child is positive or not. Mm -hmm. that used to do normally. Let's see what other experts say. Yes, Dr. Midila, any comment? Dr. Midila is also emergency physician in Dubai. Yes, Dr. Midila. Uh, sir, I think the answer is hepatitis B vaccine complete course plus immunoglobulins. So what is the logic of giving the immunoglobulin to the patient? Immediate exposure because uh, after delivery, the mother's blood might have been baby's blood might have been exposed to mother's blood obviously because phytoplacental and all bleeding and whatever you do seizure or normal there should be some contamination na? each other's blood so to cover that immunoglobulins can be given okay so what i mean just again trying to understand immunoglobulin giving immunoglobulin what effect we are trying to achieve or how how basically the immunoglobulin will help to this patient or baby, I mean, baby boy. We are, right? Because you are giving uh, to the baby boy, na? Yes, sir, Appropriate baby. regimen mm -hmm. of immunization for the baby boy. That is the last slide. So we are giving the vaccine to the baby. The hepatitis B, obviously, it should be given, right? Plus immunoglobulin. Mm -hmm. So one is for the immediate effect and uh, another is for, like, one is active and one is for the passive immunization. Basically. Okay, so which one is active, which one is passive? Active is hepatitis is B vaccine. Uh, vaccine is the active and the passive is immunoglobulin. Okay, so what do you mean by active and what do you mean by passive? Active means uh, like it will uh, take time to generate the like from like a uh, uh, host will generate the uh, <clears throat> immunoglobins <clears throat> after a few days. Uh, that is active immunization and the uh, immunoglobins which work immediately. <clears throat> Wonderful. So basically active immunity and passive immunity we, we heard, I mean, we did long back in MBBS, isn't it? Right? Yes. So active yes. immunity means when you get some infection, bodies, yes. B, B cell or the natural our cell mediated immunity and humoral immunity, something we read, right? If you remember or not remember, these are yes, the two keywords. So cell mediated means cell mediates the immunity like T lymphocyte. In HIV, what is the problem? cell mediated immunity problem cd4 cd8 cell is destroyed <clears throat> cannot perform the cell mediated immunity that is why the t cell and uh, of the cd4 cd8 will go down and patient have an opportunistic infection this is cell mediated right one is a humoral which produce the antibody and provide the resist uh, this uh, immunity so two way we provide cell mediated humoral humoral is basically antibody right so one is local cell mediated usually and one is systemic right so that will going to give you. So when you had some infection or when you give some inf and vaccine, the body will produce antibody that is active, right? And when you ready to use, right? Body will produce immunoglobulin that is active. Before body produce, you give directly immunoglobulin to the patient, right? That is passive, isn't it? Body has nothing to do, right? Body doesn't need to produce anything. You just give the immunoglobulin. That's it. It's directly ready to use, ready made, instant. Is that clear? 
So this patient basically need the two things because hepatitis B virus, there are very high risk vertical transmission. Number one, what is vertical? From mother to baby, whatever spreads the infectious things, it's called vertical HIV, vertical HBSG, vertical HCV. From mother to baby, it pass, it's the word called as a vertical transmission. Is it the word? Go and read it. So vertical transmission are very high chance. Can anyone tell me in general what so are the percentage? Breaking, sir. It's not audible. Yeah, is it better now? Probably my internet slightly little. Bit. <coughs> sorry. Uh, sorry to interrupt, but the voice breaks, sir. Yeah, one second. Huh? Let me let me little do the adjustment. <coughs> Yeah, am I audible now? Yes or no? Am I audible now? Hello? Am I audible now? Yeah. Yes, sir. Is it okay? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Sorry, probably local net is little not well. So, so what I was uh, trying to explain, yeah. Can anyone tell me idea? What is a vertical transmission rate, right? Uh, from mother to baby, how many? If you have one hundred patients of hepatitis B positive, how many baby will get the one hepatitis B? Sorry, one to two percent. One to one two percent. Someone is saying ninety five percent. So you are just, this is your guess, Dr. Tariq, or you read somewhere? Uh, I, I read somewhere. No problem. This is your homework. Post it in our mock test whenever you get free today, tomorrow. Nothing urgent. Don't get stressed. You, your homework is that find out how many percentage of the baby will get a hepatitis B if mother is positive. Question is clear to you? <clears throat> Yes, sir. Wonderful. Wonderful. Right. So this is one question. So see a lot of questions below. How many doses per hepatitis B in population? So in general for this baby, right? So we the answer is C, hepatitis B vaccine. You should give complete course, obviously, plus immunoglobulin because you don't know how much infection is there. And before this antibody or before this hepatitis virus will start effect, immunoglobulin will neutralize maximum amount. So you need to give immunoglobulin plus hepatitis B, right? So you give a first dose to the baby at the time of birth and same time you give the immunoglobulin, preferably within 6 to 12 hours. It's a preferred time, right? Another question, another question here. Rule of three, one should know rule of three. Hepatitis B virus is more dangerous than HIV and read all markers. So these are the another few questions, not going much in detail, but important. We'll discuss definitely in some other lectures of GI. So this is what the literature says. Okay. Hepatitis, uh, right, B virus infection, if you have HBV infection, how you need to do, how you need to interact is that, right? So hepatitis B virus. Right, newborn born to the infected mother should be vaccinated. First dose of vaccine plus hepatitis B immunoglobulin within 12 hours. Within 12 hours, within 12 hours. This is most important high yield point within 12 hours. So if somebody is asking you, what if it is 48 hours, then answer is no. You just give the hepatitis a vaccine, not the immunization. Is that clear to you? So there is a twist in the question. No? They ask you, <coughs> probably they ask another question that, oh, baby comes. And mother is now asking after 96 hours that uh, what is the best treatment for this baby who delivered to the hepatitis B mother. Then answer is only give the full course of hepatitis B. 96 hours, whatever the damage and whatever the things happened, it happened. Now you can't prevent it, right? So this is very important things we must know. We should remember uh, very well in our mind. Is that clear to everyone? Yes, sir. If a patient comes after... Uh, 48 hours, then we will not go for immunoglobulin. That's correct. That's correct. You are absolutely understood well. That's correct. Right? So this is again a trick, na? This is a little twist in the things. So we must know the tricks and tactics because every time they will not ask you my questions only, na? whatever it's written on the website. They may do little twist as well. So I'm trying to cover all the things what they probably or possibly going to ask you. 
right? And that is what the learning is, right? Not just mugging up the things. If they twist, question that, okay, patient have a suicidal ideation. Only treatment is ECT. That's it. If they have 96 hours after the hepatitis B, they comes to you. Mother is hepatitis B and baby delivered. Come to you after five days. What to do? Don't give the immunoglobulin. <clears throat> just give the full course of hepatitis. That's it. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Wonderful. Yes, sir. You all are very brilliant. So, newborn to infected mothers, right? As I rightly told, newborn to the infected mother, right? Should give the hepatitis B vaccine course plus <clears throat> the immunoglobulin, preferably within the 12 hours. And three course, 0, 1, 6, 0 months, day 1, right? When the patient comes, day 1 is a 0, right? First dose after 1 month is a 1 and after 6 months of the first dose. So, not after one month, six, after first, uh, this uh, second dose, one month, six month, right? After zero dose, six months. So, zero dose, the when you administer, say today, you administer today, zero. After one month, it's one. And six months after the first dose is six. So, zero, one, six is the ideal dose, right? Another important literature, right? HIV and H HIV and Hepatitis B co-infection. Which drug is a drug of choice? Which is a drug of choice when patient has both the things? HIV is there. Hepatitis, you find out, right? You did the screening to antenatal woman, right? And now she is delivering. She has a hepatitis B. She has a HIV as well. So, which is a drug of choice where you can think that, okay, one drug will help both? Answer is tonophovir. Tonophovir. Fix in your head. Tonophovir. About 1% of the patient living with hepatitis B infection also have a HIV infection, right? Conversely, the global prevalence of hepatitis B infection in HIV infected person is a 7.4%. Huge percentage. 7.4 is not small number. What they are saying, this is the literature officially from the book. Since 2015, WHO has recommended to treat for everyone diagnosed with HIV infection, regardless of the stage of the disease. So everyone, regardless, stage 1, 2, 3, 4, CD4, CD8, whatever the counts or hepatitis B, virus, DNA, forget about everything. Those who have HIV plus hepatitis B co-infection, tonophovir, which is included in the treatment combination, uh, combination recommended as a first-line therapy for HIV infection, it also active against hepatitis B. So, the brilliantness or the things is that they were probably carries the same pathway. So, tonopho will not just only act on the hepatitis B, but it also helps in controlling the HIV virus. So, the common infection if you come across, right, the drug of choice, if they ask you the questions, then your answer should be tonopho vir. Tonopho vir. It's antiviral. Go and read it a little bit more. Is that clear to everyone? Uh, sir, I would like to make a small clarification. Yes, please. Uh, sir, what's the what's timeline to give the immunoglobulin? So is it uh, 48 hours or 12 hours? Prefer to 12 hours, max 24 hours. After 24 hours, no use. Okay, sir. Thank you. Great. So this is again a very important. There is no specific treatment for acute hepatitis B. Acute, right? Right? Be a more specific with the word. Acute hepatitis B. Somebody has a hepatitis B virus, hepatitis B surface antigen positive pre-operatively and they are asking treatment. There is no treatment. Acute, no treatment. But chronic, yes. Why you want to treat the chronic hepatitis B? What are the two major complications of chronic hepatitis B? Anyone? Very quickly. Anyone? Anyone? Very quickly. Don't talk amongst yourself. Concentrate. So, excellent, excellent, excellent. So these are the two things, cirrhosis and hepatocellular carcinoma. And that is why important. So whenever anybody gets hepatitis B virus and the, it is in the chronic stage, you don't want to go it in a cirrhosis down the line 5, 10 years and again, eventually hepatocellular carcinoma. So that is why you need to keep this hepatitis B virus under control by giving some drug, right? And which are the drug we'll discuss. So basically, the bottom line is that, that there is no treatment for acute hepatitis B, but chronic hepatitis B, yes, there is a medicine. Care of acute hepatitis B is what? What you, if you want to do, person keep comfortable, eat, eat a good healthy diet and drink plenty of liquid. That's it. This is the treatment. And chronic hepatitis B treatment, this is, they ask you, 
what is the treatment of choice for acute hepatitis b no treatment of choice just supportive care chronic hepatitis b how anyone can tell me very quickly how you differentiate acute versus chronic hepatitis when you label the oh sir this is acute this is chronic very quickly anyone open the marker the um, self for self look Okay, so let me let, let me tell you the things. If you want to de define in a terms of a uh, uh, time frame, one month, two month, three month, six month, twelve month, two years, then how you define acute versus chronic? Yeah, markers are there. You are right, but in terms of the definition, international definition of differentiating acute and chronic viral hepatitis is what? If you don't know, go and read it. Important. Anyone? Anyone? No one? More than six months, sir. Sorry? Yes, sir. More than six months. Uh, yes, more than more six than months. Now. That's good. Yeah, that's correct. So what happens? Say, for example, I got myself the hepatitis B, right? What happens? Body, my natural body's immune system will clear that hepatitis B, right? But what happens if my body doesn't get cleared? Then this hepatitis B have a antibody, anti-hepatitis B surface antigen antibody. We read hundreds of times, right? Anti HBSAG antibody. Have you heard of it or not? Yes, right. So you heard it, right? So this will remain, and this viral will not cleared off by your natural immunity, and from acute beyond the six month, it convert into the chronic. So time frame is chronic. Acute versus chronic is a time frame, six months. The rest of the criteria are there. This you see HBCA antibody, core antibody, core antigen. There are a lot of different lecture. We'll discuss once again antibody in detail. Right, but just for these questions, I'll concentrating on this only now. So there is no specific treatment for acute hepatitis B, chronic hepatitis B. Yes, there is a treatment. And again, the tonophovir we seen in the last slide, hepatitis B and HIV, and take avir, and take avir. These are the two important drugs. How does it act? Slow the advance of cirrhosis, reduce the risk of liver cancer, improve the overall and long term survival in terms of quality of life. All right. And most patients who start hepatitis B treatment must continue for life, must continue for life. So what's the course? There is no course. Even if the virus gets under control, you continue like HIV, like diabetes. What you do? Your diabetes at the time of diagnosis 400, right? After having a very nice fasting 80 and PPBS 110, you don't stop the drug. You don't tell the patient to stop the drug. You continue lifelong, anti-diabetic lifelong, anti-cholesterol lifelong, right? Is that clear or not? Yes or no? Yes, yes or no? sir. Yes, sir. Yes, Wonderful. Sir, yes, sir. Wonderful. So this is all basic about the hepatitis B. So you must know this is again a very, very high yield questions. One question in this questions, right? Very frequently asked, right? The patient comes to you, right? Patients comes to you on a needle prick. Needle prick of hepatitis B, needle prick of hepatitis B virus infected person, what are the chances of getting hepatitis B, hepatitis C and HIV? Three questions. Hepatitis B virus, hepatitis C virus and HIV virus. So say for example, Mr. Anthony, who is a hepatitis B positive, he is a phlebotomist. Who? Anthony is a phlebotomist, right, in the hospital. And this phlebotomist is a HBSAG or hepatitis B positive. And you are the going for the body checkup. But unfortunately, accidentally, you got a finger prick. I mean, needle prick. Right? So needle prick from Anthony to your finger. He is a hepatitis B positive. And now that hepatitis B positive contaminated blood comes in your contact while his finger is pricking to your finger. There is some accident and he prick, uh, right? He prick his finger and then your finger. Then this is a question. So this is somebody told rule of three. Rule of three. So what is the rule of three? So in this case, hepatitis. If the hepatitis B virus, there are thirty percent chances 30, from infected. And, uh, three percent and zero point three percent. Three percent. Excellent. We are brilliant, sir. Zero point three percent. So this is called three three three. So rule of three. Year thirty. Year mm -hmm. one zero is more or less thirty to three. And 3 to 1, 0 is more or less 0.3. Is that clear? So 33 and 0 0.3. This is the risk rule of 3. In rule of 3, this is how you get. So what do you think? What is the most dangerous? HIV or HBSAG? I mean, hepatitis B or HIV? 
hepatitis b hepatitis b i have read in somewhere some yeah so in that way see again 0.3 multiply by 30 I mean, zero point three multiply by hundred is equal to thirty. Am I right? Zero point three multiply by hundred is thirty. So I read in some WHO book, hepatitis B virus is hundred times more potent than HIV virus. So what we we you we should worry more with what hepatitis B virus. So those who did not get vaccinated, all we are thirty five people now in group. those who did not and we all are doctors right there is no non, nothing a non doctor in the group so, or medical student so if you did not receive the hepatitis b virus vaccine i request you you go and do it that's it to prevent cirrhosis to prevent cancer hepatocellular carcinoma is a liver cancer in layman right so don't take it lightly i took myself two times once in, in medical school another recently i received it three course because we are dealing with the patient we are handling with the patient though we are not in phlebotomy but sometime we are doing procedure then suturing or in emergency room hemoptysis or we are dealing with a catheter we are dealing with some blood like or i am doing myself a bone marrow biopsy directly entering into the bone marrow you never know what happen so don't don't take it lightly if you are not really vaccinated i request you to go and do the vaccination that's it yes so i muted all because there are a lot of background noise so you can unmute if you want to speak you unmute another questions in front of your screen a patient who recently had a hip fracture repair develops the sudden onset of shortness of breath pulse is 110 but bp is 128 over 74 the chest is clear to auscultation chest x ray is normal ekg shows sinus tachycardia abg arterial blood gas shows ph of 7.48 pco2 is 28 po2 is 75 what is the best next step in the management epixaban vq scan that is a ventilation perfusion scan another name shortly called as a vq scan ct ngo basically ct pulmonary angio let me tell you little more specific d dimer is a blood test lower extremities doppler intravenous heparin apply your triad here i mean triad comes in every question sorry diagnosis fat embolism so <clears throat> fat embolism okay how yes. do you know that this is fat embolism so in the question uh, why not pulmonary the... embolism because it is a hip fracture so which sorry sorry i'm just trying to understand what is the logic of fat fra... i mean fat embolism long bone fractures uh, long bone fractures stability is uh, so hip so hip, hip, hip fracture has a more risk of deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary embolism or 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 uh, or uh, fat embolism this patient has a hip fracture right it is first line it is mentioned that this patient had a hip fracture so i'm just trying to understand yeah both are embolism fat embolism or pulmonary embolism right so the one there is a flat a fat clot of the flat or fat is hampering the blood flow right and so and in pulmonary embolism there is a blood clot right so it's both different thing and different term na fat embolism otherwise we call na why we term other term fat embolism because there is something different so what do you think anyone open anyone it's a very important it's a this question has a 100 question in this scenario 100 it MCD. can be a fat embolism sir not the pulmonary. it can be fat embolism okay so now go go and read and post it in the group those who do some exercise i have given you to food doctors don't take it otherwise it's a learning so whatever you understood or whatever you do the exercise after my lecture post it in our mock test group so other will also understand right right and learn as well right yes. so so how you differentiate fat embolism from pulmonary embolism this is one homework 
forget about it. Second thing, what is the diagnosis? Uh, in this, in this question, I actually put it is kind of confusing because after the hip fracture is it is mentioned so it can be dvt also so, yeah very so what it is more common dvt or uh, or uh, dvt dvt, DVT is more common or fat embolism how many cases of fat embolism you have seen so far in your practice i have seen hardly two in my 23 years of practice yes sir and dvt is more common sir and hundreds and hundreds of dvt <clears throat> Almost every yes. oncology will develop down the line in two, five years. They develop some kind of thrombosis either in brain or in lung or in the deep vein thrombosis in legs. Anyway, so so prima phase, it's a diagnosis is pulmonary embolism. Okay. Now, what do you think for this patient? What is the best next step in the management? They are saying, what is the next best step in the management of this patient and why? They have not asked, but I am asking why. Anyone? Anyone? So because this is an emergency, because he's presented with sudden onset uh, shortness of breath. Mm -hmm. So here we need to diagnose as soon as possible. So CT pulmonary angio will give us an idea. So why you want to do invasive things? Or, 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 or on the suspicious base, you can't start anything to the patient? So intravenous um, so will be given for a... So hip surgery and uh, uh, abdomen surgery, they will give a, a prophylaxis, a parin, intravenous heparin will be given. That is a prophylaxis. Now we are talking about the treatment. I mean, this patient is... Or now, we can uh, give an is, initial test of D-dimers and then if it is raised, we can go for CT pulmonary angio. Okay, so what is D-dimer? D-dimers are degradation products of... Uh, Products of what? Fibrin degradation products. Fibre. FDP. Yes. Okay. So, so say for example, D-dimer is high. Example, just understanding, right? You did D-dimer in this patient. D-dimer is high. Then what do you do? Mm. Then it is confirmed. It is then in this case, we can do. Yeah, you understand confirm. my question. You have this patient with you. You want to do D-dimer. Mm -hmm. You did D-dimer. And a result, I'm telling you the result as well. That okay, D-dimer is very high. Now what you do? We can directly start the treatment. So without D-dimer, you can't start the treatment? D -dimer. Somebody's background noise is too much. So you cannot start D-dimer. I muted all. Those who want to interact, just call. Talk to me, no problem. Yeah. So yeah we can go it. with yeah, we can go with, we can go with uh, CT angio and uh, if like and then start on with uh, ep epix. Okay, so so now what's the answer so, basically? All the options are so you want to go for CTC. <laughs> You want yes, to and CT NGO and then can start the treatment. That's what I think. Okay. Anyone else? Anyone else? We have more than 30 people in. Better to do CT uh, NGO. Find where is the clot and remove it, sir. So, where do you su suspect clot in the CT NGO? And how uh, many surgeries you have done in pulmonary embolism? Mainly the car, coronary arteries we have to suspect, sir. But this is not the case, no? Coronary, forget now for coronary. We are talking for this patients only. So for this patient, what will you do? Are you going to open and do the embelectomy for this patient? Getting into the emergency room and opening the heart? We, chest? we can start heparin so directly. Because okay. like, uh, do you think that heparin, this intravenous heparin or unconventional heparin will help to the patient? So mm -hmm. if you if you have any doubts... I request everyone go and read sincerely the pulmonary embolism. What you need to do, that all also I give you idea. What are the risk factors? Which patients are high risk patients? Let me tell you those patients with lower limb surgery, those patients with a cancer, those patients with a immobilization, prolonged immobilization, right? Those patients have a hypercoagulable state, 
those patients are on certain drug like oral contraceptive pills these are the absolutely high risk patient those who will develop the and in this patient lower limb surgery lower limb surgery and hip surgery it includes right because in hip surgery and lower limb there is a prolonged immobilization during the things and after the surgery so they are at high risk any person any operation can cause but these are the high risk group they develop this so this is what is the risk second thing is how you diagnose what is the diagnostic criteria for diagnosis the pulmonary embolism so my homework is brought to you where you can use vq scan where you can use ct pulmonary angiogram where you can use all right where you can use the directly treatment on the suspicious base right what you will do pregnant woman with deep vein thrombosis what is the investigation of choice for pulmonary embolism any idea pregnant woman comes with pulmonary embolism because patient is stable the condition there are two mm -hmm. again treatment change if stable and unstable patient <laughs> stable pregnant patient stable with pulmonary embolism investigation of choice sir i read asambra saying that we have to go for a chest x ray what will you see in chest x ray doctor is it uh, x ray is indicated or it's contraindicated in pregnancy contra -indicated. Um, so, but in case of uh, suspicious about when we are suspicious about pulmonary embolism, since both CTPA and VQ scan are not safe in pregnant women because CT angiogram increases the risk of breast cancer and VQ scan uh, is teratogenic. So initially we have to go for a chest X-ray, and I'm if sorry. it is not, hmm. sir. Yeah, 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 yeah. Go ahead, listening, listening. Yes, sir. And uh, if we couldn't find out anything in the chest X-ray, the next. Next option would be an ultrasound. Fine. So your homework is to read investigation or modalities of the choice in a pregnant woman with pulmonary embolism. Are you okay with homework? Yes, sir. sir also, yes. You do, let do me the tell INR you. Test. Let me tell you. X-ray. Any kind of X-ray is absolute contraindication in pregnancy. Hip X-ray, chest X-ray, breast X-ray, blah blah X-ray, right? Because X-ray is directly teratogenic to the baby, so X-ray is never ever used in any pregnancy, irrespective of problem. Review more literature. Get back to me. Post it into the group. Don't forget to do the homework. Probably my question will be twisted and come with a pregnant lady. They put one additional word in whole scenarios. Pregnant lady. All the answer will be changed. Right. So now the homework is for everyone. Pregnant woman with pulmonary embolism. What are the investigation of choice from priority? What is the best? It's a different answer. What is the initial investigation? Different answer. Is that clear? And what is the treatment of choice for the pregnant woman with pulmonary embolism? We'll discuss. Is that clear? So here yes. let's. Yeah. So this is all questions. Huh? This is all questions in exam. When when the case is so clear, now tell me, I will tell you. Let me go back here, right? In this trial. Sorry. In this, right? In these three things, pulmonary embolism. What are the points favoring the pulmonary embolism? In this patient. What are the points favoring the pulmonary embolism? Let's go one by one. So we'll discuss. Know, Let's see. Nah? This is all everything is given here. Right? One is a hip. One is a hip. No, no. First of all, hip, fra hip fracture. So this is a predisposing factor. Lower limb surgery. Is that clear? Am I right, doctor? Yes. Sudden onset of breathlessness. So any sudden onset of breathlessness post-operatively, post-operative, Sudden means acute onset of shortness of breath until proved otherwise considered its PE. Second is MI as well, angina as well. Right, but in context with the lower limb fracture, it's PE. Second thing. Third thing, patient's vitals. The most important question, exam question, which is the most commonest, right, ECG changes in pulmonary embolism. Anyone? Most commonest ECG changes in pulmonary. Sinus tachycardia. Excellent. Tachycardia. So here you see tachycardia. 
tachycardia. 110 is a tachycardia, sinus tachycardia. Another is this. Have you heard of S1, Q3, T3? Have you heard of this word or ECG? Yes, sir. S1, Q3, T3. This is a classical change in the ECG. Classical change in the ECG. So this S1, Q3, T3 is the classical changes. In this classical changes, what you see in the lead one, there is a changes in S wave. Lead three change in a Q wave and lead three change in the T wave. So if you see in any SEG, S1, Q3, T3, it is none other than pulmonary embolism. Fourth thing, right? In pulmonary embolism, embolysis in the pulmonary vessel, not in the lung parenchyma. So chest examination is clear. It is the biggest clue. Chest examination is normal, right? What they are saying? Chest is clear to auscultation. No rails, no wrong eye, no crepitation, no foreign sound, nothing. Chest is clear. Chest x-ray is normal. So when you have patient, this is my clinical tips of 20 years. When you have patient in the emergency, shortness of breath, chest examination is normal, right? Means auscultation in all upper, middle, lower, front and back, both the lungs normal, right? With normal oxygen saturation and normal X-ray, first differential diagnosis is pulmonary embolism. Never ever miss you. Whatever you want to do, you do it later on. VQ scan, pulmonary, angio, blah, blah, blah. You do. It's important. You need to do. But the first, immediately the striking point in your brain should be pulmonary embolism. Why? When there is a chest examination. So see, this is again a point. Fourth point, fifth point, chest X-ray normal. Six point chest examination clinical is normal. Six point sinus tachycardia. Seven point favoring the pulmonary embolism. So you have so much of positive finding in a one scenario. In that case, you don't need to do any investigation. It will waste the time. Patient may go into the complication. Patient may collapse. Pulmonary embolism is one of the commonest reason for cardiac arrest. Go and read it. Cardiac arrest causes 5H and 5T. Those who have done BLS, basic life support, ACLS, advanced cardiac life support, there are five cardiac arrest, 5H and 5T. Is that clear? Anybody heard of this yes, 5H and 5T? Yeah. So have you heard of 5H and 5T? So this 5H and 5T. Yeah, so this is pulmonary embolism. So when the case is classical, you don't need to investigate this patient. So as of now, VQ scan not required, NGO not required, D-dimer blood test not required, lower limb extremities, Doppler is not required. Why? Because this is classical case, right? You have lots of information of the patient. You have high suspicious of pulmonary embolism. So now you treat this patient. So either you have, so this is a treatment. This is a treatment, this is treatment. So you obsolete the four options, right? Now, this is little difficult for you. What to select? Anyone. I make your job easy. I make your job easy now. A and E, F. What's the option? Anyone, quickly. A, Epic Saban. Why you want to use the Epic Saban? Why you want to use the Epic Saban? Huh? Why you want to do the Epic Saban? Why not repairing? Just I'm reconnecting. Huh? One minute, I'm reconnecting. There must be some problem there. Yes. Why is Epic Saban? Okay. Epic Saban does not break the new already existing clot. It will prevent from not forming a new clot only. Mm -hmm. So why the Epic Saban? Sorry, some. How do I remove this? I don't know. 
this is not going with my please talk sir <laughs> one second huh? because i can explain you but doesn't looks good when everything is overwritten One second. Yeah, all slide is showing this. Ooh, I'm not very keen in this. Oof. Okay, let me share the new slide. One second, huh? give me one minute, sorry. Just one minute. Sorry, friends. Huh? I just <laughs> it not very techno savvy, so I don't know how to erase this. Earlier it was fine. Anyone has any clue? One minute. Let me rejoin. I guess. Control R. Can you see my screen? Yes, sir. Can you this screen, new screen? Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Wonderful. At least I found out some way. Sorry. <laughs> Is it clear now? Yes. Yes, sir. Wonderful. Sorry for little interruption. Huh? I'm a bit new in this IT. Fine. So, right. So, this is what we are discussing, right? So, the when when the case is clear cut, right? When the case is clear cut, when you have clear cut case, what you need to do, you don't need to do a lot of research on this. You can directly start the treatment, right? So, when the case is clear, right? Suggest pulmonary embolism with sudden onset of shortness of breath and clear lungs in the patient with a risk factor. So you have everything, right? This is a clear case. 
pulmonary embolism with sudden shortness of breath, lungs clear, risk factors are also present because of the lower limb surgery. The first thing is to do the chest x-ray and blood gas is to start anticoagulation, right? So chest x-ray also they have done already. They have done the blood gas as well. So ABG they also had given, right? So chest x-ray ABG and then what is the most important thing is anticoagulation. Do not wait for the VQ transfusion, right? Perfusion scan or spiral CT scan, spiral CT or CT NGO or spiral CT, you directly start the anticoagulation and IV unfractionated heparin has no role. Unfractionated heparin or IV heparin directly has no role in pulmonary embolism. Hemodynamically stable patient. This patient is hemodynamically stable patient. You can see blood pressure of 128 over 74 is a hemodynamic. Uh, dynamically stable patient. So this is a hemodynamically stable patient. Start with the DOAC. DOAC. What is the DOAC? Have you heard of the drug DOAC? Anyone heard of the drug DOAC? Right? Anticoagulant. Right. So anti, it's an anticoagulant drug. What is DOAC? Direct oral anticoagulant drug. Direct oral anticoagulant drug. Right. So and these are the new drugs comes in the market for last few years direct oral anticoagulant. So earlier for years and years, we know only one drug that is heparin. It is anticoagulant drug. So which we are using and another war oral drug is a warfarin. This is IV or subcutaneously in both form available. Heparin is not available orally. Warfarin is not available IV. It's an oral drug. So for years and years, we know the warfarin or comodin or warfarin, right? We give the orally to all patients and all profile axis and treatment and DVT and PE, we give only warfarin by which we monitor PT and INR, right? So PT and INR is normally one, right? In a normal person who is not on warfarin, but those who are on warfarin, we are trying to maintain PT INR between two to three. That's it. This is what the logic for years and years. But now new direct oral anticoagulant drugs are available, right? And this is a Debigatron, very famous in the market. Another is Rivorabaxan, that is very famous, Apixaban and Enoxaban, Adoxaban, right? Let me tell you, let me tell you, it is a very complicated chart. I draw earlier as well, but I want to draw for few other doctors who are joining me first time and for years and years they have a confusion in their brain. What is intrinsic pathway and that is common pathway. So let me tell you, this is the pathway. If you remember this things never ever you forget in your lifetime this pathway which took years and years to understand but we did not understand this is extrinsic pathway this is intrinsic pathway extrinsic pathway is monitored by pt intrinsic monit pathways is monitored by ptt or some people say aptt right this is the things in extrinsic pathway there is a factor seven this is the beauty I remembered in this way since my medical school. This is seven. This is eight number factor. This is nine number factor. This is 11 number factor. This is 12 number factor. You are thinking where is the eight? Where is the number 10? Right? Seven, eight, nine, 11, 12. Where is 10? So 10 is here. It is in the common pathway. And along with the 10, Factor 2 multiplied by 5 is 10. So I remember in that way. So 3 factor in common pathway, 10, 2 and 5. So this is your chart. That's it. No need to mug up. Open any book in the world. This is the factor. And this common pathway will eventually do prothrombin to thrombin conversion. And thrombin cause fibrin or junt to fibrin clot. And this fibrin clot is factor number 13. So here 12, where is 13? So 13 is here, fibrin clot. Another name is fibrin stabilizing factor. Uh, clot stabilizing, sorry, not fibrin. Clot stabilizing factor. So if the factor 13 is absent, clot cannot be stabilized and patient has ongoing continued bleeding. That's it, right? So this is what? So here you see 10, right? So 10, fancy Roman word 10A, right? So activated 10A convert in 10, Right, that convert the prothrombin to thrombin, fibrinogen to fibrin clot. So this all DOAC, DOAC DOAC, will act on XA, XA, and that is how the name comes. See, we never read Rivora be San. XA. 
XA, you see, XA means factor 10A inhibitor. That is why Rivorabaxan, Epixaban, Epic XA, Epixaban. Got it? Is that clear? So no need to mug up. No need to mug up. See the chart now. Book chart. I created my own chart, but this is book chart. So let's go to the book chart. As I told you, factor 7, factor 8, factor 9. Where is factor 10? It's in common. 2, 5, 10, multiply 2, multiply by 5 is equal to 10. This is how I remember. So all factors come 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. This is factor 13 who is making the clot. This is 13 factor. So this is band. Can you see X, A, X, A in 3? X, A, X, A is what? Factor 10 is called X and activated factor is called X, A. So whenever you see X, A, consider this is oral factor 10, A inhibitor. Is that clear? I don't think so. I can produce better version than this being a hematologist. Is that clear to everyone? Yes or no? Yes, yes or sir. no? Right. So, Epic Saban, this all XA, 10A inhibitor. So, they Debigatron here, it blocks here Debigatron, Epic Saban, Endoxaban, Rivorabaxan. Right. So, Debigatron acts on the factor 2, but this three drug acts on the factor 10. Right. So, this is the simpler drug. It is an anticoagulant drug, oral drug, right? It is available in the market. So you must know what is this. So direct oral anticoagulant, Debigatron, Rivorabaxan, blah, blah, right? Are anticoagulant pharmacotherapy used for the prevention of thrombosis in cerebral cardiovascular context as well. So it's just not used in pulmonary embolism, but in cardiac indications as well. Why the heparin is not answered? Because intravenous or unfractionate heparin has no role in pulmonary embolism. So go and read it. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Right. So I try to simplify it whatever the best way I can. Right. So this is very important chart in the MBBS level. We we are afraid rather. I was afraid when I was in MBBS. I was afraid of what is intrinsic, what is extrinsic. I mug up all the five years, but I did not remember. Believe me. But after practice, I remembered well. Because I implemented practically what factor at what level and what where is what going on. Then it's uh, so I think this chart is easy for you, isn't it? Yes or no? Yes, sir. Wonderful. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. A, five, yes, sir. a patient with ITP, a platelet count is 5,000. The patient has epistaxis, right? So we differently discuss the, we discuss skin, we discuss psychiatry, we discuss the surgical part, we discuss pulmonary embolism, we discussing now hematology, my mainstream subject. Patient with the ITP, 5,000 platelet, patient has epistaxis, patachy as well as intracranial hemorrhage and melina. Oh my God, very tough. Best initial step, prednisone, bone marrow biopsy, antiplatelet antibody, you do sonogram of abdomen, pelvis, hematology consultation, you call me, sir, see patient what to do or you go for IV immunoglobulin. Think what you want to do. You do bone marrow biopsy, you do bone marrow biopsy. Who is ABK? If you don't mind, I don't know the name. That is why it looks like ABK. Yes, it's Abraham Kuti. Ah, sorry, brother. I. <laughs> So, would you like to comment, sir, here? What, what you... Yeah, I think it's an uh, autoimmune uh, condition. Yes. And most of those is uh, usually treated with uh, prenisolone. Okay. So, so even with the intracranial hemorrhage, you want to give the prednisolone. And how many days the prednisolone to act on the patient? Say, for example... Patient comes to you in emergency with intracranial hemorrhage, 5,000 platelet. So, so would you like to increase the platelet fast or it's okay? I mean, not a big deal. No, I, uh, 
uh, uh, from the options we're getting, I think uh, that's the closest thing I think we can do. Because Britney's if on. we... Britney Solons. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay, let's discuss. And uh, do you know, sir, if you give Britney Solon, how much time it will take at least to increase the platelet? It takes a long time. Long time means one day, two day, five day, ten day, one month. What long means what? How long? So your homework is to read on the Pridney Solon and ITP. We'll discuss here everything. It's my main subject rather. You will enjoy this. Right? Okay. So, right. Fair enough. Yes, Dr. Preeti, your answer is also A, Pridney Solon. Why you want to give Pridney Solon? Uh -huh. It is like a, it is a first line treatment for the ITP, sir. Fine. Uh, so it will take at least seven days to act. So do you think that uh, seven it, days intracranial patient will survive? No, 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 no sir. No, but I'm just uh, use the ITP only. Then only I've given this answer. No, no, it's given as well as an intracranial hemorrhage and malina means brain and bowel both bleeding patients. Brain well. bleeding, yes. So what will you do? If I say your answer is wrong, Pridney Solon, then what is the next answer for you? And why? I'm not sure, sir. Fair enough. Fair enough. I'm just trying to understand the logic. I'm trying to understand. Yes. Fine. So everybody is a brilliant. All have given the F answer. So let me tell you. Right. So this is ITP, so you over tried, right? So diagnosis, you don't need to do because they had already given you the diagnosis and scenario. So diagnosis, three questions we have to ask ourselves. This is ITP and ITP with very bad platelet, 5,000 only. It's supposed to be 150 to 450,000 just for your kind knowledge. So this is the range. So instead of 150, just 5K, 1,000, just 5,000, 5K. Extremely acute severe thrombocytopenia. And it is a bleeding. So what are the treatment algorithm for the patient? Patient has a treatment algorithm is two algorithm. Patient has a no bleeding. And another is patient has a bleeding. This is extremely important. In bleeding, right? In bleeding, two bleeding. I remembered as a BB earlier my lecture. To B means brain bleeding. That is intracranial hemorrhage. And B is a bowel bleeding or malina, brain and bowel. First line treatment is two things, IVIG and NTD. This is the first line treatment. This is the only thing which will increase the fast increment in the platelet count, not even steroid. Is that clear to everyone? Yes or no? First of all, yes or no? Yes, yes or no? Yes. Right? Yes. So here yes. both the things are there. It's an intracranial yeah. brain. Malina means bowel. So brain and bowel, you see, answer is immunoglobulin. That's it. If they are saying 5,000 platelet and just pateki, no intracranial bleeding, no malina, patient is stable, absolutely fine, or rather 5,000 platelet with no bleeding at all, even no epistaxis, no pateki, nothing. One patient comes to you in your OPD for body checkup. He is going to America, right? And he came for the pre-visa assessment or this formalities patient has no bleeding you check the platelet 5000 patient is saying sir i have no problem at all i'm absolutely fine what's the treatment right you confirm the itp give the steroid why patient is stable intracranial patient you cannot say oh intracranial patient very stable it's absolutely not stable so intracranial patient bleeding and platelet less than 10000 first is immunoglobulin if patient is not bleeding or not brain or not bowel bleeding first line treatment is a steroid any questions to the audience? Any confusion? Preeti? No, sir. Right? Uh, so, so, so what is the take-home message? Whenever ITP scenario comes, don't block your brain with the steroid only. Try to look for intracranial and bowel hemorrhage. If it is not there, 99% mm -hmm. steroid is a treatment of choice. Is that clear? Yes, right, sir. so I intentionally put the question because everyone I know that everyone will post steroid, steroid, steroid. So steroid is not the answer. Answer is the immunoglobulin. So these are the two condition. Right, fastest way to increase the platelet count in ITP is to use intravenous hemoglobin within few hours. It will increase. 
right? Because bleeding is there, and the platelet is 6,000, 5,000, less than 10,000. You need to step, stop the bleeder inside the brain. How you stop without platelet? So if you give the immunoglobulin, probably it will stop the stop the lysis or destruction of the platelet by blocking with the primary destructing site, right? At the platelet. So immunoglobulin it attached to the things and antibody it prevent from the antibody. Say for example, dramatic picture, cartoon I will draw. It's important, very important. This is platelet. Roughly. This is the receptor site antibody. So this is platelet. What happens? This antibody will break the platelet count. This antibody will break. This is autoantibody or autoimmune disease or immuno immune thrombocytopenic. Earlier, for few years ago, ITP num, name is I, idiopathic. Some people say idiopathic, but now science figure it out. It's not idiopathic. It is immune mediated. So now name is immune thrombocytopenic purpura. Earlier, idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura. So this is now immune. When there is immune, there must be some antigen antibody. So this antibody will kill the platelet count. That is why they think that this is immune mediated. So what to do? Either you kill the antibody Either you kill the antibody or you block the receptor site by which antibody will not kill the platelet count. So if you kill the antibody, that is a steroid. That is a steroid. And if you block this receptor site, then that is immunoglobulin. So what happens? When you give IV immunoglobulin, it will, it will block the site, destructing site. So antibody is there, but it will not destruct. Why? Because it will not, not fix to the... Because already the receptor is occupied on, on platelet surface immunoglobin is a set it block the things right so antibody is there but antibody will not kill the platelet and antibody will not kill platelet means platelet count will up and platelet count up means intracranial hemorrhage will control that is why it's a drug of choice this simpler cartoon picture i draw is that clear yes or no is yes, that sir. any confusion yes sir. no sir Wonderful. The steroid uh, the, uh, we give for normally five days or three No, days? doctor. No, no. I'll tell you. Steroid we not give five days. We give for this is the standard treatment what I write to patient every day in my OPD. Tablet Omnacortil or Visolon. It's a steroid. You must have heard of these two drugs. Omnacortil or Visolon yes, or Prednisone or Prednisone. One milligram per kilogram per day for three weeks and once say for example here five five thousand after one week it's twenty five thousand after two weeks is a hundred thousand and after three weeks is a two hundred thousand so it's normal become normal right 150 to 350 so usually mm -hmm. we taper after three weeks right over okay. next next again three weeks we taper so if the patient weight is 60 kg so we start at 60 so week 160, week 260, week 360, we get a proper response. After three weeks, we from 60, we reduced 60. One week after 40, one week after 30, one week after 20, 10 and stop. So three to four weeks, we will taper and stop. Is that clear? Oh, response okay. rate is 70%. 70% of the patient achieves complete remission. So with the steroid, 70% patient became from 5,000 platelet to 250,000 like that drastic response in 70% patient 30% patient may again relapse once you stop or taper the steroid it will again do down so once you stop steroid here after 6 or 8 weeks what happens then again it goes in reverse right then 200,000 then 100,000 then 25,000 and once you stop the drug again 5,000 what to do again this is question in exam mainly for hematologists not for you but for your knowledge you can rechallenge the steroid. That is one option. Or go for the splenectomy. Second best option after steroid is a splenectomy. Why splenectomy? How splenectomy removing the spleen will help? Spleen destructions of the platelet happens in the spleen. And if you remove the spleen, the lifespan of platelet will increase and platelet count will increase. It will help the patient. Is that clear? ITP is a one-day lecture, whole, but just trying to give you the brief idea. Is that clear? Yes or no? Yes, yes or sir. No? 
Yes, right? sir. So steroid yes, is a treatment of choice yes, for non-complicated, non-brain bleeding, right? So if you don't know anything, answer steroid. And before answering steroid, just make one thing sure, right? That you just go for this, that. Yeah. Before answering the steroid, you make sure that that uh, there is no brain bleeding, right? So this is algorithm I already explained you, right? Very quick few questions. Options के साथ अगर platelet transfusion का भी option हो तो we will go for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can go. The platelet transfusion is contraindicated in ITP, but the specific word is non-bleeding ITP. Is that clear? So if patient has a intracranial hemorrhage and ITP, you should give platelet. But if patient has a no intracranial, no blood, bowel bladder, just for pataky and gum bleeding, ITP platelet is contraindicated. So you can remember non-serious bleeding, right? Or non-critical bleeding, platelet is contraindicated in three things. ITP, another is TTP, thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura. Second question, third question, HIT. Type 2, heparin induced thrombocytopenia with thrombosis type 2. These are the three absolute contraindications of not giving the platelet. If you give the platelet in this patient, you are worsening the thrombosis or you are worsening the condition or not having any advantage in increment of platelet. Is that clear? Right? Yes, sir. Thank you. But answer but is, answer is non-bleeding ITP, huh? Bleeding, badly bleeding, you can give as per the book. And as per my 20 years of practice, I never give ITP. Recently, I treated one patient, just for your knowledge quickly, who has a platelet count zero. Zero. Pathologist has given hemoglobin 10 gram, WBC 6000, platelet count is zero. There is not a single platelet seen in the peripheral smear and machine is showing platelet zero. Even though I did a bone marrow, it was ITP. I had given the steroid. Patient is fine. Just for your knowledge. Is that clear? At, at zero platelet, is there chance the patient have no intracranial hemorrhage or melina? Fortunately not. As per the book, only less than 10,000 platelet, the risk of intracranial hemorrhage is 1%, 1 to 2%. Even with less than 10 is same. Even it is 9,000, 8,000 or 1,000, all are same. The risk and intensity of the bleeding or tendency of the bleeding would be the same, less than 10,000, as per the book, as per by my experience, because I'm hematologist. So I've seen hundreds and hundreds of ITP seen and treated and doing every day, common problem, right? ITP is not a very rare problem. So in our OPD, every other week, we have a lot of ITPs, right? Isolated thrombocytopenia, that is ITP, that's it. Simple definition, one line definition is isolated, means only platelets are low, rest of the everything is fine. Right, so ITP, even with the zero platelet or less than 10,000, spontaneous risk of intracranial bleeding is 1% as per the hematology book. Is that clear? Means most of they don't bleed with the grace of God. Any question? Any question? No, sir. 24-year-old man present with emergency department. We are just about to finish in next 10 minutes. So just bear with me. 24-year-old man present. Man, sorry, presents with, uh, present in the emergency department with very severe pain. His temperature is 102.3 Fahrenheit, around you can say 39, and 40 Celsius. His testes are, appear swollen and tender to palpation. Urinalysis of 50 white blood cell count. Uh, and uh, red blood cell is zero, no red blood cell, only white blood cell or urinalysis say 50 white cell. Which of the following is the next step in the management? You give antibiotic, you send for culture sensitivity for urine and try to confirm inguinal lymph node biopsy, you do, there is something wrong. Uh, you do the testicular ultrasound, USG of testis or you do the prostate biopsy, probably it could be a prostatitis. Yes, Dr. Sahar, why, why you want to do the sonography, Dr. Sahar? Sir, because uh, um, uh, this is a case of, this seems to be a case of testicular torsion. So, I would like to... Testicular torsion. As far as I understand. 
okay so so why I, there is I a temperature in a testicular torsion 102 uh, is quite high yes, it can't yes, be some infection yeah it seems to be but uh, as the testes are swollen so um... the testes can be swollen in a testicular torsion testes could be swollen in a orchitis Testis will be tors. I mean, uh, this have a swelling or swollen on epididymo orchitis, isn't it? Yes or no? Uh, yes, sir. Okay, so your homework is to read how to differentiate between testicular tumor and how to differentiate between orchitis. Both will yes. present with the pain. Both will present with swelling, but the testicular tumor or lump will never ever present with the fever. So fever means yes. infection. So some kind mm -hmm. of infection either in testes or nearby tissue. So nearby tissue is epididymis. Just sitting on the testes is epididymis. So it could be orchitis, it could be epididymitis or it could be epididymorchitis. Because when and there is an infection, when there is a testicular tumor, then there is a no post cell. Post cell when comes in the urine, right? When there is a, some infection, simple, right? White blood cell count is increased, right? Normally white blood cell count is zero. Normally, if you check your test and my test is urine test, there should not be any postal, there should not be any red blood cell. It should be zero or nil or nothing or absent, right? But they have 50 white blood cell count. So there must be some infection because patient has a severe pain, patient has a test is swollen, patient has a fever and patient has a 50 white blood cell count in urine. What else you need? You understand, Thank Dr. Sahir? Yeah, so what will you do? Still you want to do ultrasound, still you want to do some biopsy, still you want to do culture and sensitivity and then you want to give antibiotic or you directly jump on antibiotic? Antibiotic. Excellent. So antibiotic. It's a clear cut, straightforward. So don't get confused. The most likely diagnosis is orchitis or epididymo orchitis or both. So starting antibiotic is the first next step in the management. Second question. If you have given the five days course of antibiotic, patient is not improving. What you do next? Then you answer, you do the culture sensitivity, culture test. try to find out the organism because we feel that most of the UTI, it's E. coli. Have you heard of E. coli? Yes or no? Right? Yes. So E. coli is a common, right? So this all you give good antibiotic penicillin based or amoxicillin or levofloxacin or so. So that will be covered, right? But if patient car come with a recurrent UTI, then two things you have to do in recurrent uti you find out why it's recurrent uti is there any obstruction or stone or something obstructing right another is immunocompromised state why that is why it's a recurrent like diabetes or hiv or some steroid or immunosuppressant drug that's it and once you confirm then fix up the problem treat with the again course of antibiotic which is sensitive to that organism four months old girl present with severe or uh, sorry several weeks of chronic wheeze and apric episode 20 to 30 minutes after feed she has been spitting up after feed uh, since birth she has presented to the office on several prior occasion with some with the same complaint despite adjustment in the feed technique and formula consistency she is at fifth percentile for weight which of the following is most appropriate intervention Pediatric question. Earlier was hematology questions. Erythromycin, fundoplications, metoclopramide, omeprazole. Before giving any answer, remember my triad. What is diagnosis? And then jump on the treatment. So first of all, if you don't know the diagnosis of this patient, 99.9, .9, you answer is wrong in exam. Sinoric stenosis. Sorry? Pyloric stenosis, sir. Pyloric stenosis. So, what is a pyloric stenosis? You tell me what is the definition of pyloric stenosis? How the pyloric stenosis patient will present? Why patient has a chronic wheeze in pyloric stenosis? So, this is usually seen in... Um, what is the common stage of pyloric stenosis? Exam question. 3 to 6. What is 3, three to 6? Three to six, six months. months. Three to six months. Yeah. Okay. Any comment? Anyone? Pyloric stenosis, common age? Or they present usually at what age? Pyloric stenosis. This is a very at favorite. one month of uh, age. 
one month of age. Okay. So before one month, you cannot diagnose. So patient yes, will be fine up to one month of age. Two to eight weeks or before Sorry. one month, right after. <laughs> yeah, because when Birth there is... to a... one month, within one month. Yeah, because when, I mean, this is just, I'm thinking uh, that when patient has a pyloric stenosis obstruction, it cannot present in very early age because when they start feeding and they start vomiting, they start investigating, isn't it? Or mother go to the hospital and say, oh, my baby is three days old baby, but last three weeks he is vomiting. Isn't it? Something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. So why up to four months you cannot diagnose hypertrop uh, this pyloric stenosis? Sir, in pyloric stenosis, okay, there will weaning. be... Okay, When the baby starts weaning, that is the time when the mother gets to know. Okay. Around yeah. four to six months. No problem. Yeah, somebody... Sorry, forget the name. Yes, sir. You are telling something. Uh, sir, I think it's tracheo-esophageal fistula that, uh, because a baby has apneic episode after feeding. Okay, tracheo-esophageal fistula. So that is another diagnosis. So one diagnosis is pyloric stenosis because until and unless you understood this part in any MCQ, 99.9% .9 your answer is wrong. So try to make habit from today only. Any scenarios first come, first try to do practice of what is the diagnosis of this patient. So one is pyloric stenosis, another is tracheoesophageal fistula. Now you tell me, sir, what are the points favoring in the tracheoesophageal fistula? How do they present? Uh, sir, history of chronic wheeze uh, because of aspiration and apneic episode favors for tracheoesophageal fistula. Okay. Okay. So they usually present at four months. Before that, they don't present. What is the commonest age which they present? Age is extremely important in any pediatric MCQ. If you miss the age, you are you are on the wrong track. Age is so extremely important. Tracheo use of will uh, uh, will present uh, as early as birth, like immediately after birth, hmm. after so after the first. Three. Okay, are you agreeing, doctor, with the lady? Yes, sir. Soon after birth, they will present. So, up to four months, I don't think so. Tracheoesophageal fistula, something goes long, long, and somebody did not notice. Isn't it? Because tracheoesophageal fistula is what? There is a fistula, there is a tract between trachea and esophagus. So, what happens? Whenever the baby had a feed, it instead of going from esophagus to stomach, it also goes in the airway. What I understood. Isn't it? Yes or no? Right? Yes, sir. So when they entering into the airway, there is a coughing, there is a breath, there is a sinosis, there is a blah, blah, lots of symptoms. And that won't last for four months, isn't it? So your homework is to find out what is tracheoesophageal fistula, what is the commonest stage, how do they present and what is the treatment? If the patient has tracheoesophageal fistula, what is the treatment? What is the treatment of tracheoesophageal fistula? This whole scenario, oh, they come. Sorry? Surgical. 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 What is a more... Surgery is a treatment. How you diagnose tracheoesophageal fistula? You suspected. Two, two days baby. One day mother thought it's a newborn. First delivery. Mother is also new. She did not know what is tracheoesophageal fistula. She had given the, this, the feed to the baby. One day she ignored. But second day same complaint. She is now concerned. Constant aspiration and wheezing uh, or... Uh, yeah, so how, how you confirm? How right, you confirm the diagnosis? Uh, by putting... Sorry? Yeah, so the tube will turn itself rather than going inside the stomach. NG. So NG basically tube. you try to do the NG tube, right? Nasogastric tube, right? Pediatric or whatever number, right? So you do the NG tube. What happens to NG tube? It will coil there. Coil, coil where? Back. Will coil back. Okay. So so this is again homework, right? It's complete take of esophageal fistula. So it coil back or it goes from the fistula from stomach or esophagus to trachea where it go, na? wherever the pass he pass the way, it will enter, na? Right? Fine. So this is a case of GERD, G R D. Results from incompetent esophageal sphincter tone early in life 
symptoms typically resolved by one to two years. Diagnosis is clinical. However, best initial test is the esophageal pH monitoring. Endoscopy is used to evaluate erosive gastritis or other complication. The best initial therapy is a change in the feeding technique and thickened feed. Right. So two things before when you feel good, right? Don't give the feeding in a lying condition. You do it in sitting position, burping, blah blah. You do, right? So so it won't get aspirated, right? Because there is a there is an incompetent esophageal sphincter, right? H two blockers, as a cimetidin, are the considered first line in the children because of their safety profile, but PPI, PPI. You know PPI, what is PPI? Proton pump inhibitor like omeprazole, lansoprazole, pentoprazole, esmoprazole. So all azole is a PPI, proton pump inhibitor, which blocks the secretion of H2 or HCl from the gastric parietal cell and reduce the acidity. This is what mechanism of action we learned in a pharmacology. So PPI is all azole. Osmoprazole are more effective in suppressing the gastric acid production, right? But it is not safe. So that is why it is a cymatidine is a drug of choice. So our answer is E. That's all. Clear. Clear. No reply. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Clear. Clear, sir. Yes, sir. Wonderful. Last questions for today. We have few questions, but we'll cover probably. We'll discuss a lot today, but it's all worth. 18 months old, present with a fever of one week, rash on his hand, with disquamation that developed today. On examination, he is noted to have a conjunctival infection, arrhythmatous tongue, cracked lips and edema of the hands. He has a palpable and painful lymph nodes in the neck. What is the next step in the management? Again, my triad, again, my triad, again, my triad. Without diagnosis, you cannot jump on the treatment or management. Got it? So think over it. What do you think? What do you feel? What it could be? What this condition could be? So this triad, again, what is the diagnosis? How you investigate and how you treat? Applies to every question. So we don't know and we are trying to give the answer of this. So how do you answer treatment without knowing the diagnosis? So first tell me the diagnosis and then tell me the management. Sir, it's Kawasaki. Wonderful. Brilliant. How do you know, doctor, it is a Kawasaki? What point favors in the Kawasaki? So because uh, the painful lymph nodes with cracked lips... Okay. Okay. So that is the diagnostic criteria, isn't it? Yes, sir. So, so if you want to diagnose Kawasaki, what is the most important thing you will look for in the patient? There is a creamy option like a conjunctivitis, rashes, and the erythematous tongue is there. Lymph node, painful lymph node is present. Excellent. So these all are a classical point, right? Yeah. For the Kawasaki. So at least we concluded something in this is the Kawasaki is the diagnosis. Wonderful. You told Azil, right? Diagnosis Kawasaki. Yes, sir. So Kawasaki is Indian or outside? Kawasaki is Indian? <laughs> Don't take it. This is not MCQ. Japanese. I'm just trying to understand. I don't know, sir. <laughs> Kawasaki. Japanese. You know, there is a one motorbike in. India earlier, Kawasaki. Yes, I, I know that, sir. Kawasaki is tied up with Bajaj. So, Kawasaki Bajaj. I used to ride on the internship, Kawasaki. It's not my own, on friends, Kawasaki. Kawasaki Bajaj. So, Kawasaki is a Japanese man. So, this Kawasaki mm -hmm. invented that if this is the presentation, give the name of Kawasaki. Right? So, this Kawasaki right how you confirm the diagnosis this is you do okay so disquamation red painful tender lymph nodes so you want to do some investigation to confirm the kawasaki or it's not required is good enough it's good enough sir from the symptoms from the history 
fair enough, good enough, right? So you don't need any diagnosis. Fine. What is the treatment? I think I mean, will be treatment for first 10 days, within first 10 days. Okay, so this patient comes to your OPD or emergency, whatever. How you start the treatment? What is the first treatment? Let me write down first treatment to the patient. Forget about option. What what will you, how you treat patients? Antibiotics and aspirin. So start them with antibiotics. Antibiotic. No, no, one by one. Sorry, I cannot manage many people. Sorry, antibiotic. Who told antibiotic? Yes, sir, antibiotics. Start them with antibiotics once okay. diagnosed. Fine. One more question. Why you want to give antibiotic? Is it an infective disease or non-infective disease? It is an infective disease, sir. Okay, infective disease. Which organism caused this Kawasaki? Streptococcus. Streptococcus. Don't take it otherwise. Are you confused between scarlet fever and Kawasaki? No, 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 sir. I'm not confused, but scarlet so, will cause the streptococcus caused by scarlet. Sir. So, so you this is this is a, come to the basic. This is infective disease, inflammatory disease, or autoimmune disease. It is a vasculitis. It's a vasculitis. So, vasculitis is because of infection, inflammation, or autoimmune. Autoimmune. You as ill, are you getting me? Yes, sir. Yes, what sir. So, so you tell me now. As ill, you tell me. You started this uh, thing. So, I'm just trying to uh, stick to you. So, so antibiotic, why you want to give antibiotic? What is the logic of giving antibiotic sir, in this patient? Sir, no, sir, I really confused it with scarlet fever and that's why I told antibiotics, sir. Yeah, so, this is not infective, no? There is no box, yes, no yes, infection, sir. no bacteria, no virus, no, no fungi, no parasite. Yes is causing this disease. It is a vasculitis, told somebody, vasculitis. So this is a vasculitis. In vasculitis, there are three vas vasculitis. Mo one question in exam, small vessel vasculitis, medium size vasculitis, large size vasculitis. Again, you guys mug up thousands of time, but we never thought what is small vessel, what is medium vessel, what is large vessel. So this, this Kawasaki is which vessel? Small vessel? Medium vessel, large vessel, what vessel? Medium vessel. Medium vessel. Okay, so what is a small vessel? Example of small vessel vasculitis. Give one one example of sure. vasculitis. Small sure. vessel vasculitis, medium vessel uh, vasculitis. Yes, uh, right. sure. Sorry? Uh, vessel, uh, if I am not sure, but I think maybe it's like. You can unmute because there are a lot of background noise, so I mute all. Drogstros is an example of small vessel vasculitis. Sorry? Microstros. Okay, fine. Fair enough. Fair enough. So, you never expect this question, isn't it? That somebody will ask you such questions. Because we are reading for years and years, small, medium, large, but we never thought, what is it? Right? So, anyway, this is not, uh, Dr. Azil, this is not a scarlet fever. This is... Okay, Dr. Azil, this is Kawasaki, right? Yes, sir. This is a yes, Kawasaki. Sir. Kawasaki disease is an autoimmune or vasculitis. IV, Ig, and high dose aspirin should be started immediately. What is the why the immediately? Because in Kawasaki, what happens? The commonest complication of Kawasaki, there is a aneurysm formation, vessel aneurysm, and aneurysm will rupture. Right, and patient will die. So, what is the logic? Right, you give the aspirin as well as IVIG autoimmune disease, like IVIG you had given in ITP autoimmune disease. So, Kawasaki IVIG and high dose aspirin should be started immediately to prevent coronary artery disease, reduces the risk from 25% to 5%. Treatment of IVIG and aspirin as soon as diagnosis is made to prevent the development of coronary artery aneurysm most important complication and IVIG reduces right this complication steroid are of no help in Kawasaki steroid are of no help in Kawasaki so all autoimmune disease you always think oh this is a uh, right you must have to use this you must have to use steroid never ever use steroid it is a don't use the steroid in this condition right and this is the thing this is an excellent chart 
right this is a aorta this is a aorta main aorta this is a large vessel this is a medium vessel this is a small vessel so large medium and small vessel so large vessel is a giant cell arteritis or temporal arteritis have you heard of the name temporal arteritis or giant cell arteritis is a large vessel medium vessel is a poly arteritis nodosa or kawasaki disease so it's a medium vessel vasculitis and small vessel vasculitis long list but you can see cutaneous vasculitis cryoglobulin vasculitis granulomatosis with poly uh, arrange, uh then this chuck strauss syndrome so little complicated name but you just need to keep this chart in mind so this is the large vessel then eventually going peripherally small 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 and tie up with the capillary where arteries and veins will met right so this is vein venules and capillary so arterial exchange and gas exchange occurs at the level of capillaries so if it is at the large medium small vessel and arteriole same way venous venule and capillary right so arteritis can be a large it can be a medium it can be a small that's it so depends on that what involves <clears throat> there is a various different different pathology and pathophysiology so that's all for today for now right hopefully you learn and you enjoyed so before ending my session i would like to have quick voluntary feedback about the learning today what we learned what is new things to you what 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 makes you little more serious about the presentation or what the mistake or what improvement you found in today's session quickly Sir, you heard uh, this doak for the first time sir ever i've never come across that so thank you for that sir and also this confusion between kawasaki and uh, scarlet fever scarlet fever is a, sir, is I'm, a so I'm kind of out of it right now sir yes no no i understand <laughs> but, you know, scarlet you just see the strawberry tongue you know strawberry yes. tongue that is a scarlet strawberry tongue just a quick point short review point right anything else amazingly explained sir thank you very much sir thank you for your feedback i need one to new learning those who joined first time i want to have right those who attended the first time lecture today any input excellent explanation sir thank you for that sir and uh, actually i had took a lot of time to explain each and every question sir lot of patience in it thank you so much sir Thank you sir, very actually, much. Actually, I am first time. Uh, I am actually Sumi. My name is Anne in this. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, Sumi. You are yes. from Oman, right? Yes. 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 Wonderful. Yes. How is your experience? I mean, this is the first time we are conducting very yes, regularly. Yes, this is my first time. Yes, sir. I actually uh, this uh, kind of question where this triad diagnosis, uh, investigation, and treatment. That is something actually very uh, catchy for me because normally when I see these questions, you don't diagnose it very fast. You go for the treatment or you just read the question like that and you just try to sort out the answer. So this gave a good uh, thinking for me, like smart session, to be honest, rather than sitting and reading the books. No, no. I mean, that is important, but this is smarter way and we discuss every time the same way for many years yes. so that would be interactive basically interactive see these all are questions in the book doctor so it's not yes. nothing rocket science right but the way yeah. experts Answer. tell you the way i tell you probably it's not written yeah. in the book right you know you, yeah. you mug up all the time small vessel vasculitis medium vessel long vessel big vessel but you don't know the concept what is yes, a small exactly. vessel and big vessel and this so you are mugging up every time you are forgetting every time you thousands of time you see intrinsic extrinsic tell me how is the concept now and how was the earlier concept it is very clear sir very clear i mean yes. it's understandable yeah i mean it's easy na? now even you yes. forget the if you i tell you factor 12 is in intrinsic or extrinsic you forget but i try yes. to make it so easy seven is this side all is this side that's it so you need yes. to remember Right, 8, 9, 11, 12, anything wrong with this, you monitor PTT. That's it, simple. Yeah, Otherwise, yeah. what happens? You keep mugging, 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 and end of the day, you forget oh, what this factor and yes. what PT, what PTT. Forget yeah, about right? exactly. So, so basically, we are here trying, not me alone, all coach are expert like me, and they all uh, are hello, sir. In uh, Sorry to interrupt. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm, in, no, I'm no. in a shift, actually. I'm yeah, an yeah. emergency physician. 
Excellent. Uh, like, uh, I have a patient like DK. I need to rush actually. Carry on, sir. Carry on. Carry on. Sir. Yeah. Carry on. Thank you. That's for, thank you for the class. And it was it, it's been a wonderful class actually. Carry on. Just give the IV fluid to the DK patient. That is a first line treatment. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Great. Wonderful. That is the exam question. So that is why I discuss. <laughs> yes, great thank Sumi. You. So thank you very much, Sumi, for your kind feedback. I I must appreciate your presence today on the thank Sunday. You. And uh, yes. any anyone else last but not the least anyone? Uh, sir, uh, thank you so much. I am Dr. Abid from Pakistan. Your session was very helpful for us. Thank you, sir. Very good, very good, Dr. Muhammad. Keep in touch. So anyway, thank you very much. I am ending this session trying to give you and provide you the uh, sessions video by end of the evening because recording will take some time, but I will provide you. We'll see you soon with the next lecture, obviously on next Sunday, but prepare well, prepare yourself, whatever the homework I'd given you, go open up the book, try to push yourself a bit hard, 110% guarantee to pass, I believe, <laughs> right? Because we are not reading the way we should supposed to read. We are just mugging up the answer. We are just doing ratifying, doesn't help. The way what I did for one and a half, two hours approximately, if you do only three, four hours a day, in one day, even though you solve 10 questions, you are equivalent to 100 questions. Because in one question, how many questions we solved? Lots of questions, the whatever the way, direct, indirect, pregnant, non-pregnant, this, that, anything can come. So try to try to think in a broader way while you are solving the questions. And most of the questions, all I picked up is all from our website. Everything is there, explanation is there, everything is there. But just try to interpret it. Why this? Why this not? Okay. So thank you very much. And post your feedback in our group as well. Later on, whenever you get free, enjoy your day. Enjoy your Sunday. We'll see you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you.